And with that, I want to make a point to thank our sponsors for today. We couldn't put this on without them. The folks at the Center for Children's Healthy Lifestyles and Nutrition um, and the Cancer Center are both sponsors for our day today. Um, we have this QR code. If you have feedback you want to provide, we'll, we'll put it up throughout the day um, and send it out in an email to all the attendees. Um, but we're happy to always hear from you, hear what you're looking for, what resonated, um, so that we can continue to provide relevant content to everyone. Uh, also, if you are a postdoc, we are getting ready to um, sort of refresh our KPA board. We're looking for a new chair. I will be coming off. This is usually a one-year um, position, so we need a new chair. We need new board members to join um, some of the folks that are already taking part. So if you're interested in that, please reach out to me um, and uh, we'll get you sort of brought into this. Okay. So the first session I am presenting, it's on writing a non-performative DEI statement. I'm in my fourth year as a postdoc here. Um, and as I said, serve as a chair of the postdoc association. All right, a little disclaimer about this presentation. So I'm speaking to you as a, a white woman. Um, this is based off my experience. Um, if you are black, brown, indigenous, hold multiple marginalized identity, identities, I'm in no way trying to minimize any of your experiences, um, but I have created this primarily with the intention of speaking to white folks because that is my experience. And um, as we'll see, white people hold the vast majority of faculty positions in academia, and we have the most work to do to ensure that there is diversity, um, equity, and inclusion. Um, that being said, I think everybody will be able to take away something from this, or I hope so. Uh, and so if something resonates with you, great, take it. If it doesn't, just leave it. And um, okay, so for today, our outline, we're going to talk briefly about why diversity, equity, and inclusion. We will go through some of the work that, in my opinion, you need to do before you even start writing this document. And then we'll lay out specific elements of a DEI statement. When do you provide it? What does it look like? And I'll show you um, my statement as an example. Okay, so this is from Scott Page and Robert Harris Jr. from a Advancements in Science lecture that was given in 2015. And it's quoted in an article that we'll, we'll look at a little bit today. Um, so they say diversity defined as differences in how we see the world, how we think about the world, how we try and solve problems, the analogies we use, the metaphors, the tools we acquire, the life experience we have makes us better at what we do. And so... Um, a group from the ICAN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in collaboration with the Infectious Disease Society of America um, got together to understand why diversity is beneficial in science in particular. And so they published this paper that you can look up if you're interested. Um, and their, their overall findings were that diverse groups have can have complementary skill sets which support science, they're better equipped to address health disparities. The intersectionality allows us to highlight and enrich our overlapping identities. And they also found that they um, publish more frequently and are cited more. So um, we'll come back. They also give some actionable guidance and we'll come back to that later in the presentation, but let's first define um, 
diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then we'll look at diversity at KUMC as an example. So diversity refers to who is present in the workplace. Equity refers to fair treatment for all people. So norms, practices, and policies in place. Ensure identity is not predictive of opportunities and outcomes. And inclusion refers to how the workforce experiences the workplace and the degree to which orgs embrace all employees and enable them to make meaningful com contributions. All right, so within faculty, so this is um, only faculty members. These are only full-time faculty members. And this is taken from the KU um, Factbook dashboard. Uh, this is specifically for KUMC, but the KU numbers are very similar. Um, and what we can see is that when we look at um, race across the faculty members, we see uh, nearly 72% of faculty members are white with um, the rest of the the groups being represented by 13% um, Asian people, uh, Black, people that identify as Black, only making up 2.6%, et, et cetera, for everybody else. And so we can see that we absolutely have a diversity problem here at KUMC, um, and it's not unique to KUMC. Um, if we look at... Uh, sex and how that separates in across faculty we see nearly 57 percent are men and 43 percent are female and we can't uh the dashboard doesn't allow you to look and compare salary between race and sex um, but a study based on the salaries in uh 2018 from the American Association of University Professors, so this is pre-pandemic data, show that uh, for full-time tenure track and non-tenure track faculty, um, women were paid 82% of what men were paid. So we see these diversity statistics, um, but likely not telling the full story about equity within um, academia. So there's a lot more um, data that we could collect to really look at how equity and inclusion, um, how there's work to be done within equity and inclusion as well. But KU isn't alone in this um, typical pattern. We see this across universities. Um, and uh, in particular, this is because we live in a white supremacist patriarchal society that celebrates and supports those with certain identities while discriminating against and marginalizing those with other identities. Um, we can notice that within the, um, the sex data, we don't even have an option for people that identify as being something um, other than a man or a woman. So we're already seeing those biases at play with the, the data we're collecting. Most often, it's those with the most privilege that are in positions of power, while those with the least social capital are intentionally kept out of those spaces. So um, let's talk about privilege. This is from Marie Beecham. She's an advocate and social um, advocate for social justice and unity. And she says, privilege isn't the presence of perks and benefits, it's the absence of obstacles and barriers. That's a lot harder to notice. If you have a hard time recognizing your privileges, focus on what you don't have to go through. Let that fuel your empathy and action. Identifying these um, roadblocks that don't exist for us can be really challenging. Um, like you didn't walk into this room and identify all of the sights and smells that you didn't see. Um, and it's a similar thing for our privileges. We're not generally thinking about what isn't there in front of us. We're only seeing what is. And so it can be hard to identify those um, privileges that we may have. 
Lucky for us, the folks at FORT, which stands for Framework for Open and Reproducible Research Training, um, created this academic wheel of privilege to help guide us. Um, at FORT, they seek to advance research transparency, reproducibility, rigor, and ethics through pedagogical reform and meta-scientific research. There are seven categories within their academic wheel of privilege. We'll run through these categories. Um, you might want a piece of paper and a pen or at least a, a Word doc open so that you can um, start to identify where your privileges lie. I want you to, to start doing this work to identify that. Um, the setup for this, as you move to these inner circles, you have more, you have increasing privilege if you fall on these outside edges of the circle um, that is um, provided less privilege in our society. Okay, so let's run through these. First is race. They break race down simply by skin color. We know that um, folks that are white have the most privilege in our society, whereas those um, with more melanin are less privileged. Um, so go ahead, identify where you lie in this um, category. Next up is health and well being. That's divided by neurodiversity, mental health, disability, and body size. For neurodiversity, um, if you are neurotypical, the world is created for you and you have the most privilege. If you hold some or multiple neurodivergent um, conditions or diagnoses, uh, you have less privilege. Mental health, they categorize as having robust mental health, being mostly stable or vulnerable. Disability, if you are able-bodied, you have a lot of privileges. If you um, hold some disabilities or are multiply uh, disabled, you hold less privilege. Um, Obviously, this would also depend on um, uh, the specific disability and how accommodations are made generally or not at all for you. In terms of body size, we know that uh, if you are if you exist in a smaller body, you are given a lot of privileges that folks that exist in a larger body are not. We know that. Um, I study obesity, and we know that folks with obesity that exist in larger bodies are discriminated against across multiple domains, including pay. They receive less pay for the same job simply for existing in a larger body. Um, so you can identify within this category where you lie as well. Next, we get to childhood development. This is broken up into caregiver educational level, childhood household wealth, and childhood household stability. Caregiver educational level uh, with the least privilege, having your caregivers have primary educations, um, then secondary, and then tertiary or advanced degrees. Uh, we know in academia specifically, if you are a first generation student, which means that you are the first in your family to attend college, you have less privilege than folks that have uh, caregivers that have attended uh, any college. Um, also, if you're a PhD student and you're the first in your family to obtain a PhD, you have less privilege than folks who have parents who hold PhDs. Um, so we see that pretty clearly that caregiver educational level um, definitely affects uh, access and knowledge about um, graduate school and, and college in general. Household wealth, if you come from um, generational wealth, if your uh, caregivers were wealthy, you have the most privilege with it decreasing um, as wealth decreases. Household stability, um, they describe this as having a stable household, a mostly stable household, or an unstable household. Certainly, there's um, some room for um, uh, understanding what exactly that means to you. Next up is living and culture. This is divided by religion and culture, citizenship, language, current wealth, and housing. 
within religion and culture if your religious and cultural uh, beliefs and practices are widely accepted you have the most privilege in the united states um christianity is the most widely accepted uh, religion and you move um out of this circle if your uh, culture and religion is usually accepted versus not widely accepted. Citizenship, this is a big one, especially for trainees in academia. If you are U.S. citizen, you're provided a whole lot of privileges that if you are not a U.S. citizen or if you are undocumented, you do not even have access to. So I've um, been fortunate to obtain several grants from uh, the National Institute of Health or NIH, uh, which is a part of our government that provides um, provides grants to to scientists. And if I was not a U.S. citizen, I would have never even been eligible; would not have been able to apply. So certainly, um, citizenship plays a big role in our privileges in academia. As does language, if you speak English as your first language, your primary language, um, you have additional privileges within science in general. Um, certainly, there is a lot of research that is done that is published in um, non-English languages that does not even get seen by many people because they don't um, speak anything other than English. If you learned English, um, you still have some privileges compared to those that do not speak it at all. Uh, current wealth status, if you are wealthy now, regardless of what your childhood um, was like, you have more privilege than if you were not wealthy. Housing, if you own property, you have the most privilege. If you are renting, um, you're sort of next, and if you are unhoused, uh, clearly you have the least privilege here. Next is caregiving or caring duties. Uh, this could apply to uh, children, partners, family members, anyone. If you are um, providing care, you have, um, as the sole care provider, you have the least privilege. If you have shared caregiving um, duties, um, you're sort of in the middle, and if you are not responsible for caring for other folks, you have the most privilege. Education and career, this is divided into funding, funding and resources, your career stage, institution, and formal education. For funding and resources, if you have funding um, and high resources, you have the most privilege. Um, this decreases as funding and resources um, decrease. Career stage, uh, the vast majority of us are early career, so we have the least amount of privilege compared to those in their mid and late career. Institution, they lay this out that those at in teaching um, intensive institutions have the least privilege with those at research intensive um, institutions having the most privilege. And then formal education, if you hold any degrees, you have more privilege than those that do not. Um, certainly, all of us um, fall into this um, very privileged position um, in terms of education. And then the final category is gender and sexuality. Uh, for gender, cis men hold the most privilege with cis women um, after that, and then uh, trans, um, uh, intersex, and non-binary folks with the least privilege in um, academia and in society in general. Sexuality, uh, heterosexual people have the most privilege. Uh, gay men come after that. Again, we're seeing this um, uh, patriarchy um, uh, benefit for men. And then after that are folks that identify as lesbians, bisexual, pansexual, or asexual. All right. So we've, um, hopefully you've taken the time to identify where your privilege lies within um, these seven categories and, and subcategories. Um, and I wanna just make sure we make a note that holding one marginalized identity 
does not then make you immune from aligning with your non-marginalized identities to cause harm, nor does it make you immune from internalizing social prejudices. So I am a, um, a woman, which is a marginalized identity, um, but just because I hold this marginalized identity, that doesn't mean that I don't internalize sexism. And it doesn't mean that I can't still cause harm to other women because of those internalized um, prejudice. And it also doesn't prevent me from aligning um, with uh, or using my whiteness to cause harm to folks that are non-white. We live in this um, uh, white supremacist patriarchal society that is upholding and celebrating and supporting just certain identities. And no matter which identities you hold, you're not immune from internalizing those. So um, we really have to then investigate these privileges and identities that we have, whether they are marginalized or not. So we're going to run through a series of questions, and I want you to um, answer them as honestly as you can. You can jot something down that comes up for you um, or just identify which um, which of these identities uh, best answers this question for you. So to start, where do you have the most privilege? So out of all of these um, different things on this wheel, which one provides you the most privilege? For myself, certainly. And you, and you can also think about this in terms of um, personally uh, in your life and also professionally in your academic uh, career. So for me, I mentioned that my citizenship is what has allowed me um, to even have access to these grants that have um, been so uh, important in my career. And so without that citizenship, um, I would not even have been eligible. And so certainly that's one at the top of the screen. We see um, in our chat, education, certainly having access to education might be what is um, driving that um, privilege for you within your academic um, career or just career in general. Sexual orientation, great. Another great example. We know that that as we said, if you are um, heterosexual, you have much more privilege than if you are not. Um, certainly as a white person, whiteness for me has been a huge privilege that I um, have um, in existing in the world we live in. Anybody want to share? All right, no pressure. Okay. Next up, where do you have the least privilege? Citizenship. Yeah, if you are not a US citizen, that certainly provides um, a huge barrier to um, to you in terms of um, wanting to be successful in academia. Most of us are early career, so certainly we have less privilege um, in that setting as well. Maybe you don't have any funding that might be tied to citizenship, um, but maybe you don't have any funding that would be less privileged. And then obviously different um, personal identities um, would be at play. Renting a home. Yeah, a lot of times we have to relocate for this career in academia and we frequently relocate and that often comes with um, making it really challenging to own property or perhaps um, you don't come from generational wealth and so owning property is challenging. Maybe you had to 
pay for a college yourself. And so um, owning property is not an option. Caretaking for sure. Uh, if you have a, a child you are taking care of, if you are um, the sole caretaker, certainly that um, provides even less privilege to you. And if your child has um, uh, some type of neurodivergence or disability, that adds to that as well. Language, certainly, if you do not speak English as your first language, it can be extremely challenging to um, be writing complicated scientific papers in a language that is not your um, primary language. We make it more challenging to communicate things, uh, make it more challenging to understand literature, skin color. Certainly black, brown folks are, are definitely discriminated against. All right, let's go to the next one. Which identity do you think about the most? My um, my mentor is a black woman and she's told me that before she even gets out of bed, she is thinking about what it means to be black in this country. I do not have to do that same thing. So which do you think about the most? You see religion, um, yeah, that can be a huge part of people's everyday lives. Um, it can also be a huge part of um, making things unsafe for folks depending on their religious beliefs. Body size, certainly. Existing in um, a larger body is extremely challenging in this in this country being a, a identifying as a brown woman yep again we're seeing skin color for folks that are not white being something that they have to think about constantly how they're existing in this world and what that means in terms of safety what that means in terms of equality Which identity do you think about the least? Funding, okay. Maybe you have ample funding and you don't have to think about funding. Maybe you're not interested in getting funding. So that's not something you're thinking about. Or maybe that was in response to what you think about the most. I'm not sure what this, with the chat. Uh, the previous, okay, great. Thanks, Daniel. That was the previous funding. What do you think about the most funding? Sure, yes. Um, you could probably tie in um, publications, things like that as well, things that you're thinking about the most. Um, although I, I don't think you can identify with, with uh, publications. Um, but I uh, think about the least is sexuality. So I will assume that this person is uh, heterosexual. And so that is just not something they ever think about. Um, that is just the default state that you would, if you are a man, you will be with a woman and vice versa. And so, yeah, a lot of times you don't have to think about that. Caregiving. So somebody in the audience said caregiving is the thing they think about the least. If you don't have anyone that you have to take care of, yeah, you're probably not spending very much time thinking about that. And you likely have colleagues that are doing that. And so this, this work of identifying where you lie in all of this is, is really about developing empathy and understanding for folks that um, these privileges and identities are are going to drive different behaviors and drive um, us to act in in different ways and set us up for, um, you know, if, if equity is about outcomings having nothing to do with your identities, um, and we know we don't live in an equitable world, we're looking at these identities predetermining uh, what we are able to achieve. Um, 
and and hopefully you are um, creating a better understanding of what some folks are experiencing. Which of these privileges did you earn? Certainly, um, if you have a degree of any kind, there is some extent of earning that you had to work to achieve that. Yeah, perhaps um, things have set you up so that you would um, be more successful, but there is some element of work that has to go into that. Career stage, if you've made it through um, to mid-career or later, certainly there's some work that had to go into that even if it is also aided by other privileges you have. On the flip side, which ones did you not earn? Certainly skin color is not something that is earned. It is just bestowed on you. Many of these are not things that are earned, but it's just luck of the draw. Childhood stability as a, er, something that was earned. Sure, maybe there was a lot of work that had to be done to be able to achieve that stability. Maybe for you, it was just a given. Earned degrees citizenship. Yeah, some people work really, really hard to gain citizenship here. And certainly that is also affected by other privileges. We know it's a lot easier for, um, for white people to gain citizenship here. Um, and so um, uh, and that is something that can take years and years of work to be able to earn that citizenship um, and that status not earn child stability. Okay, yeah, maybe maybe that was just you were lucky to have um, parents or caregivers that were attentive um, and, um, you know, maybe had, maybe had stable housing and, and all the ways that you could define stability. All right, where do you have the most power? What we'll start talking about as we start moving into uh, writing this statement is how are you using your privileges? How are you using that power that you hold within your privileges to be able to enact change? So where do you have the most power? Likely that that is coming from some of the areas where you are most privileged, but not necessarily. Yeah. It's like obviously it's like it depends on the person, but I think as a grad student, we have access to like free therapy. And so like I think that's something that wasn't an option for me before, but even having access to that to work on myself as a student to be really has been like essential for me. So I would say it's like in your power to like work on your mental health, whether it's like with the resources that are good for you or like taking it into your own hands, like it's something doable. Yeah. Students completely accessible. If in case you couldn't hear on um on Zoom, we have a participant that's saying uh, mental health is where they have the most power. Certainly our students have access to free mental health um, resources. So if you didn't know about that, please look into that. Postdocs, you also get eight free um uh visits with a therapist as part of just being uh, with KUMC, and so you do have a lot of power to take um, to take advantage of some of those those resources and things that are accessible to you. Other folks are saying um, being bilingual is a place where they have power, um, or being fluent in in English. So certainly, you have a lot of power if if you speak English, and then um, if you speak multiple languages. Wow, what a great resource for your communities to be able to communicate fluently in multiple languages and speak directly to folks in the language that they best understand. 
uh, we're seeing um, power in the research research that they're doing. Yeah, certainly the research can be a way that you can um, drive um, more inclusion, more diversity, more um, equity. And then finally, which of your identities can be used to cause harm to others? If you are white, 100% your identity can be used to cause harm. If you are heterosexual, all of us that hold degrees, you can absolutely cause harm based on how you interact and treat folks that do not hold degrees. Religion, absolutely. If your religious beliefs are widely accepted, you can absolutely use those to cause harm. To discriminate against other religions. I think body size. Body size, certainly. We live in a, a fat phobic society and none of us are immune to internalizing that and can absolutely be used to cause harm to other folks. Okay, we are shifting gears to move into speaking about um, these this actual document that you're putting together. So this is my mentor, Nikki Black. Uh, she says, if you are doing the work you say you want to do, it will continuously present itself to you. She says that actions are proof of what we believe. And they will always tell on you. So um, we're going to start thinking about these actions because it's the actions that you really want to speak about in this statement. Um, okay, um, a DEI statement, usually it is a one-page document. Sometimes you will have institutions, departments that ask for something different. Sometimes they want it put together with a teaching statement. Um, there are cases where you will not be asked for it at all, but if you have a one-page document, it's a really great starting place. Um, and from there, you can adapt it as you need to for uh, different things that, that um, folks might want. Usually, this is submitted in your initial faculty submission application packet. So um, we're running through a cover letter today a research statement, teaching statement, and DEI statement. Generally, those are the four documents that you're submitting along with a CV. Different places will do it differently. Some of them have like outrageous things that they want you to do. You have to rewrite everything just to fit these um, things. And, and it's a, a really laborious process to um, draft all of these documents. But if you have a one-page DEI statement, that is a really great place to start. You're going to start with an introduction, then you're going to speak to these actions that demonstrate your commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then I think it's a great idea to, um, to mention, bring up their commitment to DEI. What have you found from that specific university, department, et cetera? So let's run through these. Okay. So again, this is all my opinion. This is what I've done and what works worked for me. You're going to identify your privileges. Um, and then you may choose to speak to your marginalized identities. So um, especially if you are a white person, if you are a man, I think it's really important that you identify those privileges because of how impactful they, they are. But then you may want to speak to some marginalized identities with the, the acknowledgement that um, it is not always safe for people to, to disclose of all of their marginalized identities. So 
certainly if that does not feel safe to you, please do not, um, do not do that. Um, but if you are a black, brown, indigenous person, um, absolutely you can speak to your experience in, in academia with those identities. Um, I caution white people from, from speaking to their one marginalized identity and thinking that is sufficient. Um, I think if you are white, you need to be talking about the privileges that you have. Um, okay, so that's your introduction. Uh, this is my introduction, which I'll just read out loud for, for everyone. Higher education is built on a foundation of exclusion in which those not born with white male cis hetero affluent privileges have been purposefully marginalized. Whether we are benefiting from or disadvantaged because of our identities, no one is exempt from what it means to live in this white supremacy, capitalistic, ableist, cis hetero patriarchal society. The presence of marginalized identities does not prevent someone from aligning with non-marginalized groups to perpetuate harm. As a white Latina, my Mexican ancestry does not make me immune from using my whiteness to discriminate against those with more melanin, nor does being a woman prevent me from upholding the patriarchy. Because of this, if we are to truly seek diversity and inclusion at an institutional level, it is vital that we first work to understand where our privileges lie and how we have internalized the ideals that society deems most worthy. So clearly, um, this, is, this is showing what my beliefs are about um, the society we live in and um, what, what my thoughts are in terms of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah. Why this is saying you're talking about white male cis hetero privileges. I think people take that as a level of assumption. Yeah. That there's a lot to say that certain positions do their beliefs to them. It's like how do you go about that without feeling shy or like you don't understand that? Yeah. So the question is um basically like, is something like this inflammatory? And is this now limiting um, my ability to, to get these positions that I'm seeking out because I am so blatantly calling out this white um, male cis privilege? And my, my thoughts on that are a couple. This might not be a safe tactic for everybody. If you are a black woman, Perhaps this is not the tactic that you're going to go after um, because of what it means to exist as a Black woman in, um, in academia. And so this is certainly not the route that everyone should go. My mentor says, though, um, those, those bridges that you're so afraid to burn, where do they lead? And so in that sense... With my privilege of being a white woman, a highly educated white woman, um, for me, I am not interested in the universities that see this and say, this is inflammatory, no way. Like, great, I don't want to be a part of that anyways. And I think for me and my privilege, this allows me to find places where I will be a better fit where I will have people that say, yeah, this is actually exactly what we want for our department, our university. And so for me, that is that is the route I'm going because I have these privileges that allow me to really um, be blatant about, about calling out facts. These are all like facts. If there's anything that is untruthful, like go ahead and tell me, but like these are facts. And so- you can say like, this bothers me. And yeah, I can say, okay, but it's the truth. And so that is me. This is one way that I am using my privilege and saying like, okay, I really don't care um, because this is what's true about the society we live in and definitely true about academia. Um, and this might not be a safe route for everyone to go. And so if you hold multiple marginalized identities, you may not, it might not be safe for you. And because um, you are already discriminated against more than I am as a white person, um, 
other white people reading this on search committees might find that even more inflammatory than when it comes from a white person. So certainly I think you need to um, talk to folks that look like you, that hold those same marginalized identities you do and um, sort of get fee. I certainly got feedback that the things I wrote were inflammatory and that I should tone them down. And because of my privilege, I said, no, I'm not going to. But for you, that might be a route that you need to take because um, we we see that. What was it for, for Black folks at KU? We have only 2.6% of our faculty. 2.6. Anybody know what um, Kansas City percentages are? 22% of folks in Kansas City are identify as black. So perhaps for you, if you are if you are black, um, brown, indigenous, um, that is not this is not the route to take. Um, so please use your discretion in how you in how you go about this introduction. Instead, maybe you're speaking to your experience as a black, brown, indigenous, a person with multiple um, marginalized identities, what what has this experience been like for you um, so that you can um, sort of have that baseline of, well, this is what I know to be true from my experience in academia. Regardless, this should be a smaller section, just an introduction. Really what we wanna spend the bulk of our time on are your actions. And so um, this is going to be widely variable for folks because it's going to depend on how you have used your privilege, what you have done um, in, in your past. This might be research. So we heard somebody say um, that they use their research, they have power in how they're using their research. So maybe you are working specifically in marginalized communities and your research is specifically focused on things that... Um, folks in marginalized communities experience. So I study early life stress. We know because of racism that folks in marginalized communities are exposed to more early life stressors. And so I could speak to my research as being something that is hopefully going to provide more equ equality. It could be teaching. How many people have had experience teaching formally? A few, probably less here because we're at a medical institution than if we were at a primarily um, undergraduate institution. But in teaching, what accommodations do you provide for your students? How do you set up your class so that you are making this as inclusive and equitable as possible? I record all of my lectures so that folks can watch it multiple times. People do not speak English as their first language. That can be super beneficial also has, has subtitles in the recordings. And so that can allow people to better um, follow what I'm saying. I grade all of my exams anonymously so that I am as much as I can not bringing those biases into grading my students' um, work. What else are you doing to provide these accommodations for folks? If you don't have uh, experience teaching, you certainly have experience mentoring uh, high school, undergraduate, post bac graduate students within the laboratory setting. What are you doing in the laboratory setting in the mentoring that you do to provide inclusive, equitable places for people to learn? Where do your biases come into play? If you have someone who's brand new to working in a lab, are you providing an environment for them to learn? We all have to start somewhere. What service are you doing? Whether that's within academia or um, out um, in general. We have a graduate student council. We have a, a Kansas Postdoc Association. There are, those are two key groups that you could be um, working with or, or be involved in that are providing things to help facilitate learning and growth inclusion for um, your colleagues. Uh, maybe you are in the big brother, big sister program. 
Maybe you're doing community outreach. Maybe you're going to local high schools and teaching um, science or part of a, a, a women in STEM program. What are you doing in terms of service to, um, to show your commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion? What educational opportunities have you sought out? Have you done anything to go find these opportunities? We have a DEI office. They hold um, free trainings that you have access to. Have you started there? Have you sought out other folks? If you are white, you should be learning from black, brown, and indigenous people. Have you sought out teachers and are you compensating them for their time? And then, and then importantly, um, how will you use your privilege in the future as a faculty member? So regardless of what identities you hold, if you end up in a faculty position, you have an extreme amount of privilege and power. Even if that's not, not equally across everyone in a faculty position, you still have a lot of privilege. And so how are you going to use that um, in the future to create a more equitable, inclusive place? to make sure that that people, if you are black, brown, indigenous, that the people coming along after you are not experiencing the same hardships that you did. This is from um, the paper we talked about earlier. This is what they say can help foster diversity and inclusion, be a mentor, celebrate achievements, volunteer, give a seminar, build a diverse team, and check your biases. So this is mine, um, it's two parts, but I say continuing on. To this end, I have sought out learning opportunities that educate and challenge me and personally invested in programs, including several led by my mentor, Nikki Black, who's an activist, educator, creator of the Interrupt series. In 2023, I took part in her first cohort of Interrupting White Womanhood and subsequently enrolled in Wayfinder Activism Incubator. These programs have allowed me to better understand and prepare for how I will use my privilege and power to undermine the systems in academia that serve to discriminate against and exclude large groups of people. As someone who undoubtedly benefited from affirmative action, we know that white women were um, the, the greatest beneficiaries of affirmative action. I am even more committed to prioritizing this work given um, the Supreme Court's latest ruling. My commitment to diversity and inclusion and my desire to affect change is evident in my actions. I serve as the chair of the Kansas Postdoc Association. In this position, I created this career development programming, um, mock study section, blah, blah. These events are aimed at demystifying the grant reviews and the job market so that everyone can have access to the resources and information they need to succeed. All of our events are accessible virtually or in person, recorded and freely available on a YouTube channel to increase accessibility and allow for asynchronous viewing. In addition, I've led our advocacy work at KUMC. This year, our goals have been to create a welcome packet for incoming postdocs, increase minimum pay, and provide relocation stipends, particularly to international postdocs. I lead our discussions with faculty members and university administrators as we work towards implementing these changes. Anti-racism, anti-exclusion work is a type of work that's never completed. It's legacy work. I'm excited by the additional opportunities that will be available to me as I transition to a faculty position and continue to build a legacy for future generations to benefit from. On a broader scale, I have plans to create a cohort of faculty members who are interested in doing this self-liberation work so that we have support and community in building a more diverse and inclusive academic environment. I also look forward to building a laboratory and classroom environments that engage in challenging conversations, embrace imperfections, acknowledge privilege, provide accommodations, and uphold transparency, particularly regarding the unspoken aspects of academia. So after you've gone through that, um, I think it's important to sort of um, give a nod to what they're doing. You will have to find this um, on their websites uh, in large part, or if you know someone within the department or at the institution, maybe you can get first town accounts of what they're doing. But what have you identified about their institution, department, or program, or research that excites you most in this commitment to DEI? 
um, my example, I'm looking forward to learning more from the faculty and staff within Department X um, about current efforts in diversity and inclusion. I'm excited to see so many faculty prioritizing research efforts within communities that have been historically abused and or ignored by medical and research communities and look forward to future collaborations on these important projects. So this university in particular, um, the vast majority of the faculty members in the department were working with marginalized communities. Um, but you may see different outreach programs that they have um, or um, even just a very diverse faculty. Um, and those might be things that can tell you more about what they're doing. Yeah. So do you think that for the most part, these departments that ask for DEI statement normally have some kind of DEI things going on, like committees and those who don't normally will ask for it? I think so. That's, pro that's probably been what I've seen. Like if they're asking for it, you can go to their website and they'll say something about DEI. Sometimes it does look pretty performative. Like there was one case where it was like newsletter coming soon. And it was last updated in 2020. And so you're like, okay, you're, we're really working hard, aren't we? Um, but yeah, I think if they're not interested in diversity, they're not asking for it. Um, and so that might be a way of either weeding out or just, you know, identifying for you, hmm, maybe this isn't the, the safest place for me or the best fit, or maybe I want to go there and, and be what drives this work there. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much been what I've seen. Um, I just wanted to uh, make a call for our um, DI office. Certainly, if you are, you know, maybe you're sitting on, in on this and this is the first time you've really been even thinking about any of this and you're like, hmm, I don't know where to start. Well, starting with their, their trainings is a really great place to start um, and you can learn more from them and then continue to um, develop your, your knowledge base for this topic. Um, we only have a, a minute left, but if anybody has any final questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. Okay. Identities, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's um, not uncommon where folks are like, you know, either it's like, well, I am the diversity. So like, this is easy. I can definitely speak to my experience or like, ooh, I am not the diverse hire, the diverse um, person. Like there are plenty of, of white people in academia. And so that is where you have so much power to to call that out and then use that power to affect change. Yeah. I also just want to add to that. I think that researchers are struggling with this field. Like, I look white and I, I found that I find that I have family who don't look like me, who don't have that black on their house, rely on people like me to speak out because my words have come out of your place. Yeah. Somehow your words actually matter as well. And 
so that's just how the act is. But I just wanted to let everyone know that there are benefits to being able to be able to find this at 